Cameron, the uh, the prevailing um, view, you know, based on market pricing, is that the US is in for a soft landing. Uh, everything's going to be okay. The interest rates are going to come down. Uh, the, the 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 world reserve currency is in good nick and all the rest of it. But you don't hold to that. You think that that there's something very serious about to happen in the US Treasury market, which is really the center of the global financial system. So what is that? Can you just explain that and uh, why you've come to that conclusion? But maybe just first outline what it is you see coming. Sure. So in my view, uh, you need to think about the global financial system as sort of a, a game of monopoly. Um, in the game of monopoly, there can be an unlimited amount of money that is exchanged or traded throughout the game. Uh, the question becomes, well, how, how, how could that change? How could you change the, the rules of monopoly such that the underlying currency that you're using in the game no longer has value? And the answer to that is that you exit the game. You stop using that currency or you substitute that currency for something else. And it is my view that essentially that is what's happening in the world today, and it's happening through de-dollarization. Importantly, on top of that, what we're beginning to see as well is that because so much money has been printed over the last several decades, um, now that interest rates are rising, meaning the cost of capital is rising exponentially, and it has for the last 12 to 18 months, that liquidity is beginning to contract, and all of a sudden you're beginning to see liquidations insolvencies and disruption. And my sense is, uh, Eddie, that that process, that unwinding of all of this debt over the last several decades is just beginning. So de-dollarization, can you just explain that to, to viewers? Sure. So, you know, part of the reason why the United States has had such a, a tremendous run, financially speaking, why it's the global reserve currency why uh, international transactions are settled in dollars is because it was convenient. It was uh, the most liquid market in the world. And the United States has been perceived for the better part of half a century as a stable financial hub where you could park your assets, where you could invest freely, where you could trust the central government in the United States. Those uh, core competencies, if you want to call them that, are no longer the case. And a lot of this really began with the Russian incursion into Ukraine, because when that happened, effectively what the world uh, determined was that their assets were only as safe as Washington, D.C. decided them to be, meaning that the United States government had weaponized its financial system against, in this case, Russia, and presumably could do that against other powers around the world. That sent a very dangerous signal to foreign investors all over the world who are concerned about their assets. And that began a cascading effect of de-dollarization. At the same time, other economies around the world, specifically China, but there are many others, are becoming increasingly powerful. They're growing economically. They're more politically influential on the world stage. And so the question is being asked, do we really need to use the legacy financial system centered in New York City and Wall Street and controlled by Washington, D.C.? And increasingly, the answer is no, we don't. So it's not just then a function of the excess uh, debt that's been built up. Maybe we could just backfill a little bit of that for people uh, listening in on the, uh, the debt to GDP now versus in the past and where it's at. Sure. So right now, the U.S. government has about a $32 trillion debt and rising very quickly. In fact, it has risen about a trillion and a half dollars over the last 90 days alone. Now, a lot of that is because of the Inflation Reduction Act um, that the Biden administration initiated, but we are spending at, uh, at an extremely high rate, which means we're borrowing at a high rate. Now, this is not new, right? It's just accelerated in recent months in large measure because of a, a public health crisis we know of as COVID that forced the government more or less to deploy huge amounts of cash in the form of stimulus checks to plug a short-term economic shortfall, meaning uh, lockdowns, right? So when the lockdowns occurred, the government essentially had to step in and make sure that in lieu of economic activity, U.S. House households and businesses and so forth could stay afloat. So that's one segment of the debt. But 
is that big is that big savings pile now still there or is it has it diminished or where where well, is that some at? debate about uh, number one how much of it there was I, I my estimate suggests that there's about two trillion dollars worth of uh, government spending that went into the private economy and created artificial savings for households right and that that savings was then mostly spent um, as far as I can tell that two trillion dollars worth of emergency spending by the government to again forestall an economic crisis it appears to have either dwindled or is expired completely now there is some debate about that and I think we're gonna we're gonna find out this fall based on the consumption numbers but there are certain indicators that suggest that it has expired delinquencies on credit card uh, rates are rising quickly Credit card debt in the United States has reached a trillion dollars, as an example, um, and also 401ks yeah. are being uh, are being liquidated as well. So there's hardship withdrawals, which uh, your listeners may not know, but in the United States that comes with a, a tax penalty. So why would 401ks be dwindled down? Uh, suggest that households are struggling, that they that they're trying to get by. Um, paycheck to paycheck or month over month, and they need that additional savings to do so. So all of these are uh, proxies for a consumer that's under strain, and that suggests that this artificial savings has dried up. So 401ks are what we would call portable pension accounts in, in the U.S. Um, uh, financial vernacular. So 401ks uh, are usually these, these private savings accounts that go that are essentially – um, paired with an employer, right? So if I'm working for a given company, they will match, most companies will match whatever I commit to a long-term savings plan. And what goes into the, those 401ks essentially are equities, they're stocks, right? So you can see that the entire system is centered in the financial system. And so if, if the stock market contracts in any serious um, amount, that could be devastating to the savings, the long-term savings, the long-term pensions, as you say, of American households. Mm. When we then look at the United States, uh, you know, um, it, as, as an entity, it has so much, so, so much fundamental strength to it relative to other parts of the world. You know, this has been the classic argument, financial institutions, military, um, business acumen, et cetera, education systems at the top end, all of that kind of stuff feeding in. But when you look at the, um, at the overall indebtedness of the federal government. Um, what do you see? What's alarming you there outside of the lunge for the Russian assets from following the invasion of Ukraine and the response that's been made? What do you see at the at just at the basic fundamental level of the of the overall debt loads? Yeah, so there are several alarming there are several alarming indicators. Uh, one of note that uh, I've recently come across is that our interest payments so remember that in order for the federal government to finance itself, it, it has to borrow money, which means it has to find lenders, okay? And borrowing rates have soared exponentially over the last 12 to 18 months because the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates, right? So that has had a knockdown, a knock, knockoff effect on uh, the U.S. government's ability to borrow, meaning it's borrowing at a higher and higher interest rate. Well, interest payments in the United States for the U.S. government are now in excess of the DOD budget, okay? So the DOD budget year over year is about $700 billion. Uh, so this, this is a massive, so, so, massive so, amount. So the United States, okay. So just again, DOD. So, so, so in other words, the United States is now spending more on its debt servicing than it's spending on its yes. military. And uh, there are three or four major drivers of government spending, right? So entitlements is the big chunk. Um, that entitlements in the United States are legally obligated services. So specifically, there's three. There's Medicare, Medicaid, and there's Social Security. Social Security is our pension system, as I'm sure most of your listeners know. Uh, Medicare is, is effectively health care for seniors, and then Medicaid is health care for folks at the lower end of the social uh, economic ladder, right? These are folks that, that may be destitute, and so the government picks up the tab for their health care expenditure. That is about the entire tax base of the United States. So in other words, whatever the government collects in revenue year over year basically goes to paying for those entitlement programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and the interest. Now, in the discretionary budget, so these are programs that the government spends uh, at their discretion, DOD is about 50% of that budget. 
at uh, you know seven or eight hundred billion dollars today. So these are gigantic numbers, and increasingly, what's happening is that the U.S. government is um, under duress because they need to find more and more lenders, right? And and as the world de-dollarizes, or as the the bigger fish in the sea begin to divest from the U.S. financial system, that's becoming harder and harder. And of course, at, I, I should say, as an outlier, we have to keep a watch on the U.S. economy itself because the U.S. economy is what ultimately generates revenue that is used by the government to pay for all these programs. Well, if we hit a recession, even a mild recession, that could compromise long-term budgetary projections um, that the government puts out every year, which, remember, Eddie, are uh, based on two assumptions. One is that uh, spending levels aren't affected by recessions. In other words, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, that scores all of the, the federal budgeting and projections down the road, assumes that the U.S. economy will grow year over year at about 2%, 2 to 4%, okay? Well, obviously, if you have a recession, that will change very quickly. And then secondly, it, uh, it assumes that borrowing costs stay low, right, that, that interest rates stay low. Well, if those things change, uh, which I think they're going to change in the short term, all of a sudden your deficits would explode. And that could overwhelm the ability of, of the U.S. government to finance itself um, quarter over quarter, never mind year over year. Yeah, let's let's go there now. Uh, just 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 to push on a little bit from that, um, the when you look at the the balance sheet uh, of the of the federal government, uh, you look at um, the overall. I think the the level of debt to GDP now is one hundred and twenty two percent. The last time I looked at it, um, you know this is this is double what it was in the millennium. And a number of, a few years ago, I was writing a book called The Pivot about the debt and you know the front cover was the US federal uh, debt in $100 bills stacked high around uh, the Statue of Liberty you know to scale and uh, at the time it was 20 I think it was 21 trillion and it's now between 32 and 33 trillion um, and the, the the overall level of debt I think per per citizen uh, as a taxpayer citizen as opposed to those 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 alive in the United States is something like a quarter of a million each, um, which um, which you know which seems to be this seems to be coming at just about the wrong moment in terms of the balance sheet position of the United States. If you're if you're right, is is that how you see it? Well, the the, the issue here is that the United States economy, and and really this is true, I think globally as well, is experiencing a bifurcation, and it has really since the 1980s, since the beginning of globalization, and that is that. You've got the financialized economy, right? And that is largely centered in asset holders. So these are your wealthy 10% or your wealthy 1% to 5% who have gotten extremely wealthy over the last 30 to 40 years because they've owned assets. And asset holders profit immensely when uh, there's money printing, right? In other words, when, when interest rates are low and there's lots of lending and so forth, that tends to be conducive to higher start stock market valuations and so forth. And remember that the world over the last 30 to 40 years has parked most of its residual profits in U.S. equities or in U.S. dollar denominated assets, okay? So that's pushed mm -hmm. up the, the wealth of the top 10%. However, outside the financialized economy is the real economy. Those are the folks that work in manufacturing or in services, um, what have you, but ultimately, it hasn't trickled down to them because most of the, the manufacturing and, and a lot of the core competencies in the United States, as you know, have moved overseas, okay? They've moved into the developing world because it's, it's simply cheaper to manufacture goods there. Now, this system works as long as two things are true. One is that the U.S. consumer is strong, right? The U.S. consumer is the engine of, the, of this globalized financial system because we can afford to consume the goods produced in the developing world, all right? So the U.S. consumer has to be strong. On the other end, inflation has to be low, right? And inflation has to be low because remember that um, as, as long as the, the U.S. consumer is strong and as long as the dollar is weak, that means that inflationary pressures in the developing world, which are normally higher anyway, are low, right? Because the developing world cannot handle as much inflationary pressure as we can. Well, guess what, Eddie? Those two things have now changed. Now uh, the dollar is gaining in strength, which means inflation 
is disproportionately higher in the, in the developing world and the U.S. consumer is beginning to slow down, which means that we can't afford to consume all of the goods and services and manufactured products and so forth from the rest of the world. So if you add all of this up, essentially what we're seeing is a transition into a, a debt capacity world, a world in which money printing or rather liquidity is drying up. And so you're beginning to see that unravel. Now, the government and its indebtedness comes to matter in this because each financial crisis that we've seen in the lead up to COVID and, and 2023, where we stand today, the government has absorbed all of the liabilities of the system, right? So if you go back to 2008, as you know, effectively what the U.S. government did is it moved private debts onto a public ledger. Now, that, uh, the assumption was that that would essentially solve the problem, but it didn't. All it really did is it kicked it into the future, and it became, instead of private liabilities, public liabilities. Well, what happens, fast forward to 2023, now that we've got ballooning deficits, so that's money we're, the U.S. government owes this year, and we've got a national debt that's beginning to move exponentially, is that eventually you're going to hit debt capacity. You're going to start to see those debts roll over, and that's going to have a spillover effect to the entire global financial system. Hmm. So is there anything, anything you're looking at in the sort of tea leaves at the moment which indicates this a stress building up in the Treasury market like the, at the 10-year end? Or, you know, what, 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 do you, what, do you, what do you see that's kind of supporting your... Um, your, your hypothesis. Yeah, so the, the, biggest, the biggest indicator, and this is, uh, I don't think it's been discussed enough in the mainstream. It, it's uh, often discussed by more technically savvy folks that are focused on the bond market, but there's this uh, concept called inversion, right? An inverted yield curve. So effectively, that means that you're paying more in interest for short duration um, treasuries than you are long duration treasuries. Now, normally speaking, when uh, the economy is strong and uh, the financial system is healthy, you'll pay a higher interest rate for longer term debt. And the mm -hmm. reason for that is, is fairly self-evident. Longer, longer term debt is riskier, right? Because you don't know what's going to happen 10 years down the road, 30 years down the road. Well, when you get an inverted yield curve, all of a sudden that dynamic flips. And that means that you're paying a higher interest rate for shorter term duration debt. And that usually is a sign of recession. But how that curve reverts back to normal circumstances is that um, at the shorter end, those high interest rates start to come down, right? And, and they start to come down because people's confidence in the financial system and the economy starts to grow, and so the cost of capital drops. Well, that's not what's happening right now. What's happening is there is an inversion. In other words, longer-term debt is becoming... Um, higher interest rate than sh shorter term debt, but they're all moving up at the same time, right? So even longer term debt, 10 and, and 30 year treasuries, for example, they're all starting to acquire higher and higher interest rates and the short term interest rate isn't going down. So you're seeing rates go up at every level of duration. That usually signals that you're getting close to debt capacity, which means that you just can't borrow anymore. Oh, that's pretty really well explained and is the same thing happening in other uh, developed countries then when you look it, around it is and and this is what i i think should be ringing alarm bells around the world so we're seeing yields rise in in the jgb so those are japanese government bonds um now the bank of japan has been managing a, an exorbitant debt for multiple decades and that's part of the reason why i suppose people assume that the u.s government can can simply replicate it but there's some key differences we'll come back to that in a minute but uh, the uk is also seeing this as well so the uk uh, guilt market is seeing um, technical breakouts to the upside at every level of their duration as well so short and long-term duration uk guilts and so are the german bunds market so um, the German Bunds market really is the benchmark asset for the Eurozone. Effectively, what this is telling me is that the world simply has too much debt and not enough growth anymore. And so there's a psychological shift happening. And remember that central banks, they, they can control the amount of input. They can control the amount of assets that they purchase and you know, liquidity that they dump into the system. What they can't do is control panic or control fear. And I think you're beginning to see a degree of fear set in 
because there's simply so much debt that there's a, a lack of confidence that these governments can actually pay it down. When, when you then look at the um, inflation, okay, inflation is half from its peaks, but it's still, this, this word sticky keeps, uh, keeps arising. It's, it's, in other words, say the US Fed is at about 10 times what its base rate was now compared to before, uh, before it started the hike at the start of 2022. So are we in a trap then where they can't get inflation down, uh, which means raising interest rates, but raising interest rates is destabilizing the whole uh, economic structure. And uh, and yet they can't get inflation down. So so where so where does this bring us to then? What when 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 you play this out in your mind, where does it take yeah, us? Yeah. So the source of the inflation is what's particularly interesting, and it's it's somewhat uh, debatable. But my sense is that the the source of the inflation is less so the Fed. And remember that if you go back to two thousand eight when we had this liquidity crisis because of mortgage-backed securities, effectively what the U.S. government and the Fed, Federal Reserve did is they bought up all these assets, right? That's what I mentioned a moment ago. They, they moved these private liabilities onto a public ledger. And uh, the Fed was a big part of that because they, they simply bought up a lot, of, a lot of these troubled assets. Well, why didn't we get inflation then? The reason is because um, those assets those mortgage-backed securities or U.S. Treasury bonds, they stayed in the banking system. So just because the Fed buys assets, the banking system is the transmission mechanism. It has to lend that money out. Well, it didn't do so. So it effectively quarantined all of this quantitative easing that went into the system. Okay, so what changed with COVID? Well, what changed with COVID is stimulus. So now you had direct to consumer. You had no money that went into the banking system. It went right from the federal government into the hands of households and businesses. And guess what? It got spent. OK, that's one source of the inflation. In fact, uh, you might argue that's the majority source of it. At the same time, Eddie, we had this war in Ukraine. And what that has done is that's raised the, the price of commodities around the world, right? Raising. <clears throat> the price of commodities around the world is not something that the Federal Reserve can control. There's nothing they can do to regulate the, the global demand supply curve of oil. And, and as I'm sure your audience has, has uh, noted over the last few, few, few weeks, guess what? The price of oil is uh, headed back to $100 yeah. a barrel. Now that is inflationary and there's little the Fed can do about that. So my sense is that the Fed is raising interest rates because they have a framework, a Keynesian framework, that's broken. They think that they can effectively control inflation with interest rates, but I don't think that's happening at all. So all they're really doing is they're raising the cost of capital and increasingly they're depreciating the value of assets. And this came to a head in March of this year with the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank because effectively what yeah. happened is that Silicon Valley Bank which is, is no exception in the banking sector, by the way, they bought a lot of U.S. Treasury bonds because U.S. Treasury bonds were viewed as, as pristine collateral, the safest collateral that you can access in the world. And they assumed that interest rates wouldn't rise. Well, the entire banking system is flush with the same asset. Well, because the Fed is raising rates uh, with the expectation that it can control inflation, and again, I, I quibble with, with that assertion, um, it has depreciated the value of that collateral. And all of a sudden, you, you're starting to see bank balance sheets um, evolve these massive holes, right? Because the value of their collateral has fallen considerably. Um, in short, what I'm, what I'm suggesting here is that the Fed um, is using an inappropriate framework to deal with a, a more complicated global financial uh, conundrum. And that they're blowing up, they're, they're essentially implementing a self-defeating program that is unwinding debt. At the same time, inflation doesn't appear to be going anywhere. So this is the bind that they're in. And my sense is that they've lost control of both. They've lost control of inflation on the one hand, which they never really had control of, but because of government spending, which is not going to stop, and because of this global uh, demand supply disequilibrium in commodity markets, you're going to start to see food and energy prices continue to move to the upside. And at the same time, because they're raising interest rates, they're causing insolvencies. They're causing liquidations because there's too much debt in the system.
So, so well, that's very interesting because you, you were saying that, um, you know, that the central banks really can control inflation using their, their one tool, you know, under, using Keynesian economics from 1946. I think the man died. Um, but but when you when you when you play that out, then, uh, OK, so central, let's say central banks can change the rules of the game. and They're going to just continue to do what they're trained culturally to do. Um, how does it where, 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 where does this take us then and at what pace? And and what are the solutions, inevitable solutions that will that will have to yeah, be found? Yeah. So the the Fed the Fed's effort, effectively at this point, is to psychologically calm the marketplace. Right. It, it's to manage this uh-huh. deleveraging process, this unwinding of all of this debt, and uh, I, I suppose in the process communicate to the public that it's doing something about inflation. Now maybe they believe they are. You know, who knows. Um, my sense, Eddie, is that what they have done is they've triggered the debt bomb. And, you know, the audience okay. um, out there probably thinks when, when you mention things like debt bombs, the visual that comes to mind is uh, a fire or, or some kind of a bomb exploding. But that's not the way financial crises happen. They happen in waves. They happen episodically over time, right? It takes time for these financial institutions to unwind. So the, the, phase, the first phase of this process, I think, began in March of this year. Uh, you might say it was, a, it was a Bear Stearns-like event. So if you remember in 2008, Bear Stearns failed in uh, March of 2008, and then in September came Lehman Brothers. I think we're in a similar kind of framework. Now, your question is, okay, well, how does this situation resolve itself? I, I think you're going to see a default spiral. I think you're, you've started to see it in the regional banks. I think that's going to spread to the SIFI banks, the systemically important financial institutions. I think you're going to see it spread throughout the economy. The question then becomes, all right, well, what does the Federal Reserve do? Because the Federal Reserve has adopted effectively a, a, a position such that it controls the entire economy. Remember that at the inception of the Federal Reserve in the U.S., which was in, in uh, 1913, their mandate was clear. It was to regulate the banking system, and it was to serve as the lender of last resort. Well, that's not what the Fed does anymore. It does those things, plus it manages full employment, and it manages inflation. Mm. That effectively means that it is centrally planning the economy. So um, the question is, what does it do as this unwinding starts? Well, what it's done so far is it's set up liquidity facilities. So in March, it created something called the BTFP. The, the bank term funding program. And what that effectively did is exactly what happened in 2008. It started to buy up all of these bonds. However, it's also fighting this rear guard action of inflation. So it's continuing to raise rates. So what I think is, is going to occur is that this process is going to continue. It's going to raise a little bit. It's going to pause. It's going to raise a little bit. It's going to pause until something really breaks. And that, I think, is going to be the U.S. Treasury market. When the U.S. Treasury market really starts to break, in other words, when the collateral that liquidates the entire or or governs or lubricates the entire global financial system, uh, which is that Treasury bond, when that starts to fall meteorically, that's when I think the system ends. And I think you're going to see a fire sale out of that marketplace. Something like that happened to Silicon Valley Bank in March of this year. And uh, here's a, a very alarming metric that, uh, that I dug up when I was evaluating what exactly happened. About a million dollars per second was withdrawn from Silicon Valley Bank in a 48-hour period. All right? Now, I think something like that very likely could happen in the U.S. Treasury bond market if this spirals out of control. And that effectively will force the Fed then to buy the entire bond market, the entire U.S. Treasury bond market, because there's nobody left to buy those treasures, and that means that the currency itself will be destroyed. That's how I see this ending. Well, that's that's pretty dramatic. Um, uh, um, and when the money flee in, in 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 what you've outlined there, when the liquidation event occurs, the fire sale occurs, uh, and the building is the building's on fire before the Fed comes and hoses it down with even more. Um, uh, more quantitative easing uh, and all of that. Where does the money go to then, Cameron? As you figure this out, like I mean, what, what you know, because uh, there, there, 
there's a kind of a dearth of alternatives out there, certainly at the yeah, moment. Yeah, and, and before before we get to that question, I, I just want to be clear on something because you know a lot of folks think, especially in Wall Street, that the Fed can effectively do whatever it wants, right? Because it's the money printer. Well, the self evident um, the self evident response to that, I suppose, is if that were the case, why does the government raise taxes to begin with? Why is there even a bond market to begin with, right? If, if the Fed can simply print all of it, why don't they do that? Well, the answer is inflation, right? The answer is because if you do that, you destroy the currency, right? So there is an upper limit to what these central banks can do. And I, I want to make mention of the UK gilt market for just a moment, if I can, because what happened in the UK gilt market in September of last year, when Liz Truss uh, became prime minister and then was was ferried off the stage in about a 90 day period, is that there was a mass liquidation of UK gilts, right? Exactly what I'm forecasting is going to happen in the U UK in the US Treasury market. OK, well, the reason that happened is because you had all of these pension funds in the UK that uh, on margin had gone into the UK gilt market because it was pristine collateral. And as the UK uh, Bank of England, as, as the Bank of England in the UK started to raise rates, the value of that UK gilt, just like the value of US Treasury bonds in the United States, fell. And so the value of these um, pension funds, their assets and their liabilities, started to get out of whack and they had to sell those UK gilts, all right? And they had to do so in mass. Well, what happened next is instructive. The Bank of England had an emergency meeting. They stopped raising rates uh, temporarily, and they bought, uh, they bought a lot of these bonds. But here's, here's the conundrum, okay? They didn't buy everything. They bought a little bit. They didn't buy everything. Why didn't they buy everything? Because they can't. They can't buy everything. So what they set up is very similar to the BTFP. Again, the, the bank term funding program in the United States. It's an asset purchase vehicle that they set up in, in the UK. They bought some of them to psychologically calm the markets. All right? A fire sale would happen when that calming mechanism doesn't work anymore. That's the yeah. issue, okay? So yeah. when, when all of a sudden they take a, a step to buying bonds and the market continues to sell off, that's when a permutation has occurred and there isn't a, a whole lot they can do to forestall that, okay? So that's how this unwinding happens. Now, to your question, where does the money go? Well, I think uh, the, first, the first key to understanding all of this is that um, gold has been money for thousands of years. And over the last several decades, what we've observed, not just in, uh, in, in the West, where banks have been accumulating gold, but in Eurasia and Asia, they have been accumulating gold and silver at a very high rate. Now, why are they doing this? They're doing this to hedge against the devaluation of the U.S. dollar and presumably their own currencies, which they've printed as well. So gold and silver is one place that they could go. Another, um, another example of where they could go is their own currencies. So in March of this year, um, there was a deal struck between the UAE and China for natural gas, and that deal was done in yuan. It wasn't priced in dollars, all right? Uh, India made a similar arrangement with the UAE in August of, of this year, so just last month, for, um, for oil, okay? So commodities all of a sudden are decoupling from the U.S. dollar, meaning that the Indians and the Chinese and other groups are paying in their own currencies. So you could see liquidations out of the dollar, out of dollar-denominated assets like the U.S. Treasuries, and into their own currencies, right? I think that's, that's, a, that's a very likely output. Another, potentially, is cryptocurrency. Now, cryptocurrency was at one time very popular in China, and I believe it still is, although the government has regulated, um, has outlawed exchanges, as an example, so you can't trade it. But you could see lots of, uh, lots of capital go into Bitcoin or Bitcoin-like cryptocurrencies that don't have any counterparty risk. In other words, they're not exposed to the downstream effects of, uh, of the U.S. dollar. So those are three areas where you could see money exit the, the dollar-denominated system. Gold and, and silver, other precious metals. Second, their own currencies, right? So the rupee, 
the yuan, et cetera, et cetera. And then thirdly, cryptocurrencies. The fourth place you might see it is commodities itself, right? So instead of holding the US Treasury bond as collateral, you might hold oil or you might hold mm. natural gas. So all of these things are happening. They just haven't happened at scale yet because you haven't seen that, that uh, existential crisis in the US Treasury bond market or equivalent. And I think that that's going to happen probably sometime this fall. Can I ask you then, uh, even though I know it's not, uh, it's, it's just an associated related topic, and I'm sure you'll have a view on it. How does, how does all this then play into what's going to happen in America next year in the presidential election year, given the toxic atmosphere between both camps? How do you see that? Well, that's out? the million dollar question, right? Because uh, the precedent yeah. for this is probably 2008, uh, maybe the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980 on the heels of, uh, of a, a recession and inflationary pressures under the Carter administration. Um, I think the crisis that we face, Eddie, is substantially worse than what happened in 2008 and in uh, 1979. And, and I think the precedent really, you have to go all the way back to 1932 when Franklin Roosevelt was elected during the Depression. Okay, now th there are some key differences between the Depression and what we face today as well. So let's just set aside the economic differences. When FDR became president in 1932, the government of the United States uh, represented a very small percentage of GDP, right? So uh, it, it essentially expanded and created welfare programs or make work programs, social security was among them, to account or to compensate for a social catastrophe, which was the depression. Well, this time, you're going to see the unwinding of, the, of those programs because the government simply can't finance them, right? If the crisis happens the way I think it will, which is at the center of the system in the U.S. Treasury market, uh, that's going to put a damper on all of these government programs, these automatic stabilizers, as we call them, and undermine the government's ability to solve a social crisis. So if, if we get something like this before the election, I think you could see the political process in the United States break down. In other words, you could see uh, the government itself more or less default on its debt and experience some kind of a procedural breakdown, meaning you could see the president of the United States be forced to resign. Um, and what happens next at that stage is anybody's bet. But I think the, the crisis that we face, the severity, the magnitude of these economic problems and, and the indebtedness of the U.S. government suggests that something like that could happen before the election. Um, we, we are not a parliamentary system uh, the way you are in Europe. So you would just declare an election and move forward. What we could see in the United States is a cycling through of different presidents, right? So you could go from Joe Biden to Kamala Harris to then the Speaker of the House, so forth and so on. It's hard to say what, how that process ends, but there's a lot of daylight between now and November of next year. So if, if I'm wrong and you don't get major disruption, then you'll have an election and that likely will favor the opposition candidate. Um, but if you get a disruption, that's when you're in a, a very different environment. And I, Eddie, that's what I think is going to happen. I, I think the United States is going to face an unprecedented political breakdown of sorts. So any, anybody's bet is what could happen. Hmm. And um, one final question for you, Cameron. Um, you know, when you're, when, if you're addressing people over here on this side of the pond in, in Europe and in Ireland, by the way, it was, I was raising my eyebrows when you were talking about the um, socialization of debt. I mean, we, we, we did that on steroids by bailing out the entire banking system back in the day, uh, much to the absolute horror of the Irish people. But what, what do you say to people um, psychologically? How to, how should, not, leaving aside where money should go, all that kind of stuff, just how, what, what do you say to people when you talk, when you have these discussions with them and they, they come to that realization? How do you prepare them? Like, in other words, what kind of mindset should people adopt through this very volatile period if, if, if it turns out as you describe? Yeah, indeed, because the, the prospect of, uh, you know, a financial economic crisis, the likes of which we've discussed, is it's horrifying. It's, it's a lot to digest. So how does one deal with it indeed? Well, it, it seems to me that there's two ways that people, um, people confront this reality or, or the potential for very bad things to happen. Um, because of this mismanagement over several decades. 
One is that they say, okay, I understand what you're saying. Um, it, it sounds a bit outlandish, but I, I could see how something like that could happen. That being said, it's beyond my power to control, so I'm just going to get on with my life. I, I'm just going to move forward as, as if nothing has, has happened, live my life, and if, if and when something like that happens, I'll, I'll deal with it at the time. And the second, um, I think, more appropriate mentality is to engage, right? So that is pay more attention to where your money is. Pay more attention, not less, to how you're living your life. Try to adjust towards a different environment in which there won't be as much liquidity. There won't be as much financing. Your standard of living will likely drop. And taking small steps in that direction, you know, spending less <clears throat> money, paying down your credit card debt and so forth, I think those are highly appropriate steps because this transitional period is going to be very difficult. It's going to be a profound adjustment for those that have made no prior preparation at all. So I think you need to mentally and otherwise take small steps towards preparing for something like this because the likelihood that it's going to occur, I think, is growing every day. And remember, at, at core, you, you have to ask yourself a question. Do you believe that governments and authorities have the situation well in hand, or do you not? Now, if you, if you believe that the, the central bankers and uh, public officials and elected, elected politicians and so forth are competent, that they really understand these problems and that they can deal with them um, you know, at the end of the day, then you can go back to living your life. But if you're like me, and presumably, presumably like you, Eddie, if, if your confidence is shaken, if you see a lot of corruption and grift and incompetency, that's when you should start to make these adjustments in the short term and imagine a world that's very different from the way it is today and begin to prepare mentally for that. Hmm. Very interesting you should finish with, with that comment because it resonates with what Charlie Munger was saying, the Warren Buffett's 100-year-old partner, uh, just predicting, and he's very widely read man uh, for, for decades, and he's been through, been through probably every crisis since the Vietnam War, that uh, we just have to get used to uh, getting by with less. Well, you know, it, the, the thing that it, I framed it as the age of prosperity versus the age of scarcity. You know, in, in, the, in the contemporary world that we live in, um, on the surface, there appears to be lots of wealth. But my, my argument would be, Eddie, that I'm not sure that that's really true. I mean, most Americans, and America on paper at least, is the wealthiest country in the world. Most Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. Okay? They're not climbing the social economic ladder. Houses are unaffordable. Cars are unaffordable. College is unaffordable. So the standard of living may appear as though it's good, um, but I'm not convinced that it is. And part of what's holding my generation back in particular, so I'm a, I'm a millennial, and the generation that, that's going to succeed mine, they're Zoomers, so they were born after the year 2000. We have no money. right? A lot of us don't have viable careers either. And j just to throw into sharp relief the disparity between the, the baby boomer generation and the millennials. The baby boomer generation has $55 trillion of wealth in the United States. Now, obviously, it takes years to accumulate that, and we're just now beginning you know, to, to enter our prime years of earning capacity, but we own $5 trillion. Now, the math just doesn't make sense. We're not going to catch up to $55 trillion. We're not going to have the quality of life that the baby boomer generation had. Okay? So in a sense, what I'm saying is this adjustment has already begun. What, what needs to happen next is a, uh, an economy that's far more structurally sound. We need to divest from this massive indebtedness, from this fiat system that is completely out of control. And all it's really done is it's stacked enormous amounts of wealth in the hands of a very small number of people at the top, while the rest of us pay rent on the assets that they own. That system is unsustainable. It's been unsustainable for a long time. So actually, I think the other side of this is going to be a much better, more sustainable world. It's the adjustment period that's going to be difficult. Yeah, very good. Well, uh, Cameron McGregor, that's been a fascinating um, romp through the uh, the challenges that we all face. And uh, for those for those watching, uh, you know, the United States of America is still the engine room of world growth. What happens there matters to all of us. Uh, the the U.S. dollar is the the world reserve currency, but the the Federal Reserve is the is effectively the world central bank at the moment. So all of this uh, feeds into everything and all the decisions.
that face us over the next while. Uh, so we leave it at that. Uh, Cameron, thank you so much for being uh, so 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 fluent and uh, eloquent in your uh, explanation of what is a highly complex um, set of interlinking parts. It's not this is not this is not easy territory to to communicate as well as you did. So thank you very much indeed for coming. Absolutely, on to come to I, point. I really appreciate your time. And you know, I I would just uh, say to the audience um, because a lot of these these uh, metrics and numbers and so forth do appear to be overwhelming. But at the end of the day, you know, the the average guy on the street can understand them. Why? Because at the end of the day, you got to take in more than than you spend, right? You you have to make more. Um, capital or make generate more revenue than you spend in liabilities. That relationship has broken down and it's broken down for a long time. And so all we've really done is jerry rig the system. Well, now that system is beginning to give finally. Okay, Cameron, thank you very much. Well, if you've enjoyed CounterPoint, please subscribe by clicking the button below. See you next time.